wildlife one of Kenya's most valuable resources. And yet, for the longest time, human-wildlife conflict has been one of the country's greatest challenges. A growing population and inappropriate land usage are two main issues at the heart of the human wildlife conflict in Kenya. The protected areas now are surrounded by farming communities, people who are practicing different land uses. How best can we manage this direct competition for resources while promoting peaceful coexistence between humans and wildlife? Now, it is estimated that only about 20% of Kenyan wildlife lives in protected habitat. The other 80% in unprotected areas in communally or privately owned land, usually bordering human settlements, a fact which contributes immensely to human wildlife conflict. Hi, I'm Esther, and this is Project Green. Habari Unazikia wameitu wa kuigine kwa sababu haa watu ni wachache sana. Au kiangaria hapa, hapa ni, ni ndofu wa rifunja. Hii ni ndofu wa rifunja, kwa na jaribu kuinua hivi diwa toe maindi. Kwansia kama saa moja hivi, na saa kumi na bili unawasa kuziona, simefu watana pare. Kila siku inakuja. Wakati hiko pare, na murika, inarudi, inarudi tu. Eh? Ukikosa kukaa, kuka, inakujaga kila, wa, kila, kila wakati. Sasa mimi nasikirisa kama inaeda. Kama inakuja tu, nashukua mawe. Nashukua mawe. Nakuja pole pole, nafika hapa. Nasikia naenda, mm -hmm. narudi tena. The protected areas now are surrounded by farming communities, people who are practicing different land uses uh, that are coming up in the rangelands because people would like to earn a living. So they come up with all sorts of a, a kind of farming or any other activity that can generate uh, revenue to them. Just adjacent to this farm, you can see those trees right at the edge of the horizon over there. I'm being told that those were actually villages where people have vacated because of the issue of elephant invasion in the area. It's been that bad. These farmers in Wagwashe are right at the border of the expansive Laikipia ranching company. At dusk, elephants troop down from the ranch to look for a tasty treat in their farms. Efforts to contain them have not availed much. So it's about 10 p.m. now and I'm joining uh, Mr. Shagan, some of the residents uh, who are keeping vigil in the watershed. Um, they're watching out for any uh, herds of elephants that could come in to invade their farms. And if any of them do, they're going to raise their alarm and they're going to call for backup from the village. Now I understand this is a daily affair. Every night, these farmers take turns to watch out for the elephants and chase them from the farms when they invade, a task that can sometimes turn out to be fatal. We need to plan where we should put, uh, where our protected areas are and how they can be protected. Secondly, we need to look at the migration corridors. We need to acquire some areas. The government has to buy land to get areas that are good for wildlife, then settle people somewhere areas that are arable for agriculture. Many miles from Wagwashe in Nanyuki, still in Naikipia County, the story is the same. Kama last year, tulipoteza mbulokotano za maindi zote hakuna kitu tulitoa. Yeah. 
Then this year nine cabbages, we shall not harvest nothing here. Are you supposed to plant here? I may not be able to, 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 to answer that because I do not know the history of the, the history of the area. Actually, it's not the fault of the elephant. It's not. Because when the lands were subdivided, they did not take into consideration that wildlife movement and migration patterns. So I would generally say that some planning was not done in, with consideration to wildlife. Our sasan diwa wanaenda kukula uko kwa hizo mashamba ya watu. Eh, our diwa wanaenda kukula hizo mashamba ya watu. Sasa hii ni corridors za hawa wanyama. Yeah, samani kabla watu hawajajasa kila mahali. Hii ilikuwa ni corridor moja, watu wameweka fence sana. Hii fence sasa imewekwa na Kenya Wildlife Service na pamoja na ranch mwenye ranch pamoja na community. Mitigation strategies such as this have helped temporarily in containing the situation. But it is clear that the enactment of a national land use policy will go a long way in solving human wildlife conflicts in hotspots such as Laikipia County. So right now we're just uh, joining uh, the team, the KWS team, as they do their rounds, their evening rounds. Then we understand there could be some elephants nearby, so we're headed there to see what's going on. Covering an area of over 9,000 square kilometers, Laikipia is one of the most expansive counties. Lack of adequate resources and personnel makes it difficult for the Kenya Wildlife Service to promptly deal with every distress call, especially during the harvest season when they tend to receive an overwhelming number of calls. Tonight, the trail is muddy and the roads are impassable, and we are unable to carry on with the patrol. If you look at the, the land use planning in the country, they don't consider wildlife as a, a viable land use option. The government has to buy land to get areas that are good for wildlife, then settle people somewhere, areas that are arable for agriculture. But as far as conflicts are concerned, it is going to be there. So that's just a snapshot of the human-wildlife conflict situation in Laikipia County as the various stakeholders, the KWS, ranchers and the community at large, continue finding ways to manage the situation better. Let's now join Dan as he discusses this further on Green Talk next. Thank you, Esther. When wildlife requirements overlap those of human beings living near them, there is always a serious cost to residents and the wild animals. Can we truly harmonize social and economic development activities with wildlife conservation? With me in studio to answer the question, we have Dixon Kaelo, the CEO of the Kenya Wildlife Conservancies Association, and Ibrahim Kantet, the Executive Director, Eserian Wildlife Association. Gentlemen, welcome to Green Talk. So in terms of solutions, where, where, where are we? A lot of what is happening now is that we have uh, humans uh, encroaching further and further into wildlife corridors, into critical dispersal areas, into breeding areas for wildlife, and starting uh, uh, carrying out activities that are not, uh, that are not compatible with, uh, with wildlife conservation. And, and, and so how the, 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 the answer to that question is, what kind of mechanisms could we adopt that allow people and, and, and wildlife to continue coexisting. Okay. I, I think there are quite a number of examples that have been tried. Um, one that I would like to point out is uh, a formation of conservancies. But, but even with you know, the formation of conservancies and getting them to have you know, specific areas, uh, there is still serious human-wildlife conflict. Why, why is this still happening even with the formation of conservancies? I think the issue, I think the issue is humans and wildlife have always coexisted there before. But currently, something just happened. When people started realizing that there is something known as money, money became the biggest problem and the biggest obstacle when it comes to these conflicts. So money will not solve everything in terms of you know, loss of life. But, but, even, but even, let me interject here and say that compensation is treating uh, symptoms. You haven't treated the cause of the, the disease itself. So we might have whatever amount of money we have, and as long as we don't treat the problem, we will keep compensating. And we have a number of compensation schemes in this country and worldwide that have been tried and, and often they, they end up failing because you haven't really looked at what is the cause of the problem. And it gets to compensation. All these uh, national reserves and national parks should set a fee 
from uh, tourism. Whatever they are collecting from wildlife should at least have like, a sort of an insurance that will cater for any losses uh, brought about by wildlife. Mm, sure. they, should, uh, they, they should just do that and try to get, even, even the tour, tour companies, they can do something about that and get some fee which will be protecting this wildlife. But is there really a, a, a proper land use policy where, because apparently most of the wildlife is, you know, they're living outside no, the, 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 the that, area. That one should also be given a big priority because uh, every piece of land being sold, is, uh, fences get erected mm -hmm. and uh, migration corridors get blocked. Just some, some years back, you can look at Kitengela now. Mm -hmm. Kitengela, towns are mushrooming from every corner. The whole Kajadu County, towns are mushrooming all over. There's no proper uh, land use plan. The other half of the problem is actually creating a mechanism where those landowners who own land uh, will then be able to agree that yes, I live in an area which is uh, within a wildlife corridor, uh, which is important for the migration of wildlife, and I voluntarily uh, join into a system of gov of supported by government that allows my, me to use the land in a way that continues, uh, allows wildlife to continue using the land. So we need a, a, a policy and also we need practice within communities that are living in these areas to adopt uh, land uses that are, um, that, that are you know, compatible with wildlife. I'm speaking about incentives because most of the people who live alongside the animals feel that they are very far removed. The, the focus is, you know, the animals belong to the government and, you know, the people are left to, you know, to, to fend for themselves. So the focus is always on the animals. In, in Masai Mara, for example, we have 2,000 landowners who have come together and put together their uh, privatized land pieces and, and set up uh, several conservancies. These people are generating about 300 million shillings every, uh, every year. And this money is paid directly to their accounts, individual accounts. And, and, and since that scheme started in the Mara, wildlife numbers in those conservancies are unimaginable. Huge numbers of wildlife have come back. And they have even agreed that they will be grazing their livestock elsewhere and only coming in to graze in the conservancy during uh, dry, dry times because they have now seen that this wildlife in these conservancies is so valuable that I'm even withholding my livestock from so taking there. Organized. So they are, they are really getting direct income. Yeah. And, and I think your question on how do you make sure it goes directly and, and equitably to everybody, because yeah. that's the bottleneck. Yeah. That has been the bottleneck. So Mr. Kantet, what is your solution? What do you think is the, the solution? Just developing a land use policy that will protect uh, habitation and uh, try to control the human population from encroaching into wildlife habitats. All right. That's the solution. All right. Uh, I'm afraid we'll have to end this particular discussion here. Uh, so thank you very much, uh, Dixon, Kylo, and Ibrahim Kantet. Uh, thank you very much for being on Green Talk. Thank you very much for inviting me. So clearly, our wildlife is not only important for our biodiversity, but it is also our prized heritage. Therefore, we must always strive for a harmonious coexistence. On Green Hero this week, we bring you people who are working to mitigate human-wildlife conflict in their own way. Don't go away. We'll be right back. So kwa majina anaitwa Ala Mwanja. Tunaishi hapa Arisa. Iko na kondo mia mbusi ni 68. Shida misiko hapa sana ni wanyama na kula wengine hisi ya porini kama pisi, simba. Sasa ndo hapo ndo shida tumepata hapa sana. Mwaka 2009 alikuwa ni simba alikuwa amekuwa mbaya sana alikuwa anaingia hapo akakula ngombe tatu siku nyingine ya pili akakula punda siku ya tatu akakuja kula chip nimesikia vibaya sana akakuona ise wa wanyama akakula mfugo wangu naona afya na my name is david manoa i'm a programs officer of born free foundation here in kenya the Lamu Proof Boma uh, started back in 2010 after the successful uh, Pride of Kenya campaign 
where we got some money after auctioning 50 uh, lounge sculptures and we used that money to start the project in Amboseli. Uh, the process of constructing the BOMA starts with the application where the community who are in uh, hotspot areas, the areas that are hard hit uh, with conflict, that is uh, livestock killing, being killed by uh, lions. Uh, once they send us the application forms, then we assess the forms and uh, we plan for a day to go and construct the bomber. To erect a bomber, you first of all uh, measure the size of the bomber so that you can be able to estimate the material that is required, that is in terms of the post, uh, the chain link and the drum door. Once you have estimated the cost, then the community is told how much they are supposed to contribute in terms of uh, uh, the cost share. And then you organize a day where the community digs the holes and we have technicians who help the community to put up the bomber. And the community at the same time are also trained. So the community puts the poles and then the chain link follows and we finally finish by uh, putting up uh, the door. We try and use uh, uh, simple materials, uh, materials that are locally variable. We make use of uh, uh, plantation uh, posts uh, that are treated together with chain links and uh, the dose is just a flattened uh, drum uh, and then uh, the hinges we use the Maasai uh, uh, shoe uh, to make the hinges. A boma can accommodate up to a thousand livestock but on average uh, according to our monitoring uh, system we have found that uh, on average every boma has about 250 livestock. Yeah. <laughs> Since 2010, we have constructed 143 bombers, and uh, out of the 143, it's only one bomber that uh, a lion was able to get uh, into the bomber and uh, kill livestock. So I can say that the success rate is 99%. Thank you to bomber. Human settlement, there's agriculture, and then there is wildlife. All of them are competing for the same space. So if we urbanize people, so it's already happening, but we need to accelerate it, but in a deliberate way. The next thing we need to do is zone places for agriculture, places for wildlife. But you can actually do a mapping, say of elephants, where do they pass, and then zone that place, and then prevent either human settlement or agricultural activity. My message to Kenyans is that we must take seriously the, co the conservation of nature. Nature, as Wangari Madai put it, is unforgiving if we damage it. And we need to find a way of coexisting with nature in general. Wildlife is part of nature and it is our responsibility. Tangu ndamu njianze kufanyika hapa tujawaji kompensitiwa. Kutoka last year, tumepoteza zaidi ya chakula hika kama kumi. Inauliza serikali kama kuna njia ambaye tunazakua tunani, tunalipo hiyo damu njiki tendeka. 
The stand of uh, KWS at the moment, and probably the national government, is that we do not compensate for crop damage. We used to do it before, but it was actually suspended because of malpractices that came up. At the moment, we only compensate for loss of lives and injury. And uh, I'm happy, at least as a KWS officer, in the new wildlife bill, we are going to see the rates reviewed so that it can actually help the communities who actually get injured through conflict to the wildlife. I can say that uh, some of the issues that people are saying that uh, they get delay of compensation is actually attributed to when you find that someone has been given a compensation form, but the necessary document to be attached, maybe if someone has passed away, maybe the death certificate is not there or the IDs are not there, or wrong IDs have been put in those forms. Those are some of the things that make them feel they have been delayed, but that is not from the KWS point of view. Once we receive a form that has got necessary documentation, we always process it within one month. That magnificent beast behind me has a right to be here, and so do the human populations that live around these areas. We have to find a way to coexist harmoniously. Well, that's it for this week's edition of Project Green. Until next time, stay green. Since the filming of this episode, the Kenya Wildlife Conservation and Management Bill has been passed into law and addresses many of the issues raised in this program. If successfully operationalized, the act will go a long way in enhancing a mutually positive human wildlife coexistence in Kenya. Now we are right at the outskirts of the Laikipia Ranch. Now the elephants start coming from this point down to the people's farms when it gets dusk. When it gets dark, okay. So we are at the outskirts of the new. <laughs> Look at the friendship with the doggy and the cats. Iya ke karibia tu anagongwa na natoroka. Inam inam. Abo eh na eh usi guzi. No, like it's just here, Kitu. Yeah, sasa. Sasa. Oh, you're not supposed to touch it. It's a good idea.